Hi everyone, today we're carrying on, but first of all, Meaty wanted to say hello because you haven't got to see him really in these videos. Bruno's running around being his usual self. Um, so Meatloaf is going to be our reading companion today. So chapter 40, no, I don't need licked. Chapter 40, Bert finds a clue. When he heard that a mail coach had received, reached the heart of Shoeville, Spittleworth seized a heavy wooden chair and threw it at Major Roach's head. Roach, who was far stronger than Spittleworth, batted the chair aside easily enough, but his hand flew to the hilt of his sword and for a few seconds the two men stood with teeth bared in the gloom of the guardroom while Flapoon and the spies watched open mouths. And there is Bruno telling me he needs to go outside. So, one moment, children. One, out. And there's sticks. He's also gone outside. And we will carry on. Hopefully without Bruno deciding he wants to bark again. Um, you will send a party of dark footers to the outskirts of Shoeville tonight, Spittleworth ordered Roach. You will fake a raid. We must terrify these people. They must understand that the tax is necessary, that any hardship their relatives are suffering is the fault of the Ichabog, not mine or the king's. Go and undo the harm you've done. The furious major left the room, privately thinking of all the ways he'd like to hurt Spittleworth if given ten minutes alone with him. And you, Spittleworth told to, said Spittleworth to his spies, will report to me tomorrow whether Major Roach has done his work well or enough. If the city's still whispering about starvation and penniless relations, well then we will have to see how Major Roach likes the dungeons. So a group of Major Roach's dark footers waited until the capital slept, then set out for the first time to make Shuville believe that the Ichabog had come calling. They had collect selected a cottage on the very far edge of town that stood a little apart from its neighbours. The men who were most skilful at breaking into houses entered the cottage, where, it pains me to say, they killed the little old lady who lived there, who you might like to know had written several beautifully illustrated books about the fish that lived in the river Fluma. Once her body had been carried away to be buried somewhere remote, a group of men pressed four of Mr Dovetail's finest carved feet into the ground surrounding the fish expert's house, smashed up her furniture and her fish tanks and let, the specimens, let her specimens die, gasping on the floor. Next morning, Spittleworth spies reported that the plan seemed to have worked. Shoeville, so long avoided by the fearsome Ichabog, had at last been attacked. As the dark footers had now perfected the art of making, making the tracks look natural and breaking down doors as though a gigantic monster had smashed them in using, and using pointed metal tools to mimic tooth marks on wood, Shoeville residents who flocked to see the, old, the poor old woman's house were entirely taken in. Young Bert Beamish stayed at the scene even after his mother had left to start cooking their supper. He was treasuring up every detail of the beast's footprints and its fang marks, the better to imagine what it would look like when he at last came face to face with the evil creature and had killed it, that had killed his father, because he had by no means abandoned his mission to avenge him. When Bert was sure he'd every bit of detail, he'd every detail of the monster's prints memorised, he walked home, burning with fury, and shut himself up in his bedroom, where he took down his father's medal for outstanding bravery against the deadly Ichabog, and the tiny medal the king had given him after he'd fought Daisy Dovetail. The smaller medal made Bert feel sad these days. He'd never had a friend as good as Daisy since she'd left Pluritan for Pluritania, but at least, he thought, she and her father were beyond the reach of the evil Ichabog. Angry tears started in Bert's eyes. He'd wait, so wanted to join the Ichabog Defence Brigade. He knew he'd be a good soldier. He wouldn't even care if he died in the fight. Of course, it would be extremely upsetting for his mother if the Ichabog killed her son as well as her husband, but on the other hand, Bert would be a hero like his father. Lost in thoughts of revenge and glory, Bert made to replace the two medals on the barnacle piece when the smaller of them slipped through his fingers and rolled away under the bed. Bert lay down and groped for it, but he couldn't reach. He wriggled further under his bed and found it at last in the furthermost dustiest corner along with something sharp that seemed to have been there for a very long time because it was cobwebby. Bert pulled the medal both the medal and the sharp thing out from the corner and sat, now rather dusty himself, to examine the unknown object. By the light of his candle he saw a tiny, perfectly carved Ichabog foot. 
the last remaining piece of the toy carved so long ago by Mr Dovetail. Buddha thought he'd burned up every last bit of the toy, but this foot must have flown under the bed when he'd smashed up the rest of the Ichabog with his poker. He was on the point of tossing the foot onto, onto his bedroom fire when Bert suddenly changed his mind and began to examine it more closely. Oh, I wonder what Bert will find. Let's have a look. Chapter 41, Mrs Beamish's Plan. Mother, said Bert, Mrs Beamish had been sitting at the kitchen table, mending a hole in one of Bert's sweaters, and paused occasionally to wipe her eyes. The Ichabog attack on her sh their Shuville neighbour had brought back awful memories of the death of Major Beamish, and she'd just been thinking about that night when she'd kissed his poor, cold hand in the blue parlour at the palace, while the rest of him was hidden by the cornucopian flag. "'Mother, look!' said Bert in a strange voice, and he set down in front of her the tiny, clawed wooden foot he'd found beneath his bed. Mrs Beamish picked it up and examined it through the spectacles she wore when sewing by candlelight. Why, it's part of that little toy you used to have, said Bert's mother. Your toy icker. But Mrs Beamish didn't finish the word. She's still staring at the carved foot. She remembered the monstrous footprints she and Bert had seen earlier the day in the soft ground around the house of the vanished old lady. Although much, much bigger, the shape of the foot, that foot was identical to this as were the angles of the toes, the scales and the long claws. For several minutes, only the, the only sound was the sputtering of the candle and Mrs Beamish turned the little wooden foot in her hat, trembling fingers. It was as though a door had flown open inside her mind, a door she'd been keeping blocked and barricaded for a very long time. Ever since her husband had died, Mrs Beamish had refused to admit a single doubt or suspicion about the Ichabog. Loyal to the king, trusting in Spittleworth, she'd believed the people who claimed the Ichabog wasn't real were traitors. But now the uncomfortable memory she tried to shut out came flooding in upon her. She remembered telling the scullery maid all about De Mr Dovetail's treasonous speech about the Ichabog and turning to see Hankerby, the footman, listening in the shadows. She remembered how soon afterwards the Dovetails had disappeared. She remembered the little girl who'd been skipping wearing one of Daisy Dovetail's old dresses and the bandolore she claimed her brother had been given on the same day. She thought of her cousin Harold starving and the strange absence of mail from the north that she and all her neighbours had noticed over the past few months. She thought too of the sudden disappearance of Lady Islander, which many had puzzled over. These and a hundred other odd happenings added themselves together in Mrs Beamish's mind as she gazed at the little wooden foot, and together they formed a monstrous outline that frightened her far more than the Ichabog. What, she asked herself, had really happened to her husband up on that marsh? Why hadn't she been allowed to look beneath the cornucopian flag covering his body? Horrible thoughts now tumbled on top of each other as Mrs Beamish turned to look at her son and saw her suspicions reflected in his face. The king can't know, she whispered. He can't. He's a good man. Even if everything else she'd believed might be wrong, Mrs Beamish couldn't bear to give up her belief in the goodness of King Fred the Fearless. He'd always been so kind to her and Bert. Mrs Beamish stood up, the little wooden foot clutched tightly in her hand, and laid down Bert's half darned sweater. I'm going to see the king, she said, with a more determined look on her face than Bert had ever seen there. Now, he asked, looking out into the darkness. Tonight, said Mrs Beamish, while there's a chance neither of those lords are with him. He'll see me. He always liked me. I want to come too, said Bert, because a strange feeling of foreboding had come over him. No, said Mrs Beamish. She approached her son, put her hand on his shoulder and looked up into his face. Listen to me, Bert. If I'm not back from the palace in one hour, you're to leave Shuville, help North Jeroboam find Cousin Harold and tell him everything. But, said Bert, suddenly afraid, promise me you'll go if I'm not back in an hour, said Mrs Beamish fiercely. I, I will, said Bert, but the boy who'd earlier imagined dying a heroic death and not caring how much it upset his mother was suddenly terrified. Mother, she hugged him briefly. You're a clever boy. Never forget you're a soldier's son as well as a pastry chef's. Mrs Beamish walked quickly to the door and slipped on her shoes. After one last smile at Bert, she slipped out into the night. Well, that's a cliffhanger if ever there was one. So, come back tomorrow and we'll see what happens and whether Mrs Beamish comes back. I hope she does because I really like Mrs Beamish. I don't know about you. Head over to Purple Mash and have a look at today's activity and um, we will carry on tomorrow.